Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this Bright Talk Founders Spotlight webinar. My name is Kirsty Fiora, and I'm the Partnership and Program Director for Innovation Women. Today, I'm going to be inter interviewing Innovation Women founder, Bobby Carlton, who has a very interesting background, including founding and simultaneously running three companies, because, really, one is never enough. I'm going to jump right in. <laughs> Yes! <laughs> That's Bobby <laughs> laughing. Uh, I'm going to jump right in with our first question. Um, Bobby, I know you often start off conversations with people you meet with, tell me your story. Um, so everyone online right now would love to hear, what's your story? I think one of the things about uh, where I've come from is it's all about visibility. So I've spent most of my career in public relations and marketing almost exclusively for high-tech companies with a little detour into a kids' brand a few years ago. And when uh, 2008 came along and the stock market uh, and financial crisis bloomed, I had to kind of go out on my own. So that's the point at which I got into running my own companies. Uh, Kirsty and I laugh about the fact that there are three of them, but they really do all make sense. So when Innovation Nights was born, that was kind of the first one. That is a company that is devoted to getting out companies and startups out there by using social media. Uh, in that time frame when we were looking at all of the issues that were going on in the financial market, it was also the time period when social media was really getting going and I was deciding to experiment with it. So I was also on the board of the Charles River Museum of Industry and Innovation in Waltham and they had a hard time getting foot traffic. So I decided to create an event to bring people in and also launch new products. So Innovation Nights was born. Carlton PR Marketing, I think of as kind of the day job, and that was designed to get me consulting gigs, and over time it grew because Innovation Nights was so successful. And because I did so much with events, I got invited to other events, and I spent a lot of time in the audience watching the all-male, all-pale panels at the front of the room. And so Innovation Women was born. And um, I know that this is going to sound surprising to the folks who are on the, um, on the webinar. Bobby is not a fan of public speaking. She is an introvert. So <laughs> I'm really kind of wondering why you chose to open up a Speakers Bureau when you hate public speaking. <laughs> Admittedly, I got better over time. So Mass Innovation Nights is a monthly product launch party and networking event. And when we started it nine years ago, those early events, watching me be the public speaker is incredibly painful. But over time, I got better. And it was something that I grew more comfortable with. I'm still an introvert, but if you know about how introverts are defined, it's we need alone time and downtime to recover. It isn't necessarily that we're frightened to death of speaking, although early days, yeah, it was not my, uh, not my thing, I admit it. But my background in public relations meant that I spent a lot of time getting other people on stage. So running a speakers bureau actually comes quite naturally, even to the introverts amongst us. Excellent. Um, so that the speakers bureau of Innovation Women um, is specifically for entrepreneurial, technical, and innovative women. Given that, um, could you give us some reasons why entrepreneurs should use public speaking as um, a way to promote their businesses? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things about Innovation Women is we call it a visibility bureau. And the idea is to get people on stage because every time you get on stage, you have an incredible opportunity. You can connect with customers. You can connect with partners. 
You can connect with investors, hugely important for entrepreneurs, but also you're advancing your own career, maybe it's new job opportunities. And at a senior level, maybe it's an opportunity to get known as an expert and, a cred and it's a, a credibility source too. Those are the types of things that get you promotions and new jobs and maybe even someday board seats. So for us, it was really just getting people out there. And let's face it, we've all been to those all-male, all-pale conferences, right, where you see the same people over and over and over again. Meanwhile, new companies are being minted every day, and we need to hear their founders' stories. So um, thank you for the lovely segue into hearing about those founder stories. What are some of your top tips for speakers? <laughs> so the first thing that I always tell people is you have to know yourself and you have to know who your audience is. When you are getting up there and speaking, you want to be able to tell your story clearly. You want to know what you want to communicate but you also need to know what your audience wants to hear. So if you're able to solve a problem or help them down the path to solving a problem, you become a very popular speaker. Um, knowing your own story, you know, we often work with our clients and our speakers to help them kind of zero in on their story, but also the place where they're an expert. And believe me, everybody is an expert in something. Even if it's you still feel like it's something you're learning about, you're still an expert in the stage that you're at and what you learned. Very interesting. Um, so talk to us a little bit about um, tips for events and conference managers because they're also part of this equation of speaking engagements because they're the ones that are, um, that are looking for new voices. How can they ensure diversity at their events? So we've worked with a number of conferences and events to get gender balance on stage. One of the examples that I love using is StartupCon in Boston. They had approximately 23% female speakers on stage before we got involved, and we moved them to pretty much gender balance. Um, we worked with them on a process that involved um, a sequential invitation. So they were able to see who was coming on board and being able to balance and rebalance the invitations. A lot of event managers that we work with, they tell us that they sent out four invitations two perhaps were to women, two were to men, and you know perhaps the women said no, and so they ended up accidentally with an all-male panel. Uh, that's like one of those top ten excuses, I think. Um, and, you know, it happens. One of the reasons that women say no is often the same women are asked over and over and over again. So you need to look for those, um, those new voices because they're not being asked over and over again, and they probably don't have any conflicts or as many conflicts as someone else might have. Uh, women are also more likely to work part-time. They're also more likely to work for smaller companies. Those are all things that you have to keep in mind. You know, one of the reasons that women say no more than men to speaking opportunities. Um, I'd like to uh, actually take a second here to set context for um, the folks on our webinar, and that is, can you talk to us a little bit about how a, the relationship between a speaker, a speaker's bureau, and an event manager usually work, and how Innovation Women is different? Sure. So, um, so there's so many different types of events, and, and all the events have different types of um, processes that they go through. Some events only take women who apply, or speakers, who apply. Uh, we call those calls for speakers, and you see them all over the place. Uh, we collect them every week and we send them out in our weekly newsletter that's just for speakers. We usually have somewhere around 100 opportunities a week. And those calls for speakers 
will be ahead of the conference, they'll have a deadline, and people send in an abstract and a bio, and the event managers choose from amongst them. Um, other conferences actually invite speakers, and quite frankly, they're often working through their personal Rolodex, or they're looking at other events. They go to other events in their industry, and they see a great speaker, and they say, hey, you'd be great at my conference too. We call that being on the circuit. When you get one opportunity, it often leads to other opportunities. And it sounds like Innovation Women helps both the event managers expand their Rolodexes, but it also gets members on stage to get that first gig so that then they get more gigs. Yeah, right? new voices. New voices. All new right. voices. And also, just a reminder that you can ask questions too. So if you want to put a question into the little box on your screen, you can do that. So all you have to do is send us questions via the questions box. Which I was about to say, <laughs> we're going to um, turn to the audience for um, a few questions. Um, not seeing any come through just yet. Nope, we're good. But We um, can keep going. <laughs> wanted to also ask you about um, what do you feel like you learned from, so I just said, sort of level set people on when things were founded. So Carlson PR and Marketing. Um, 2008. And, yep. And Innovation Nights. Officially 2009, but I had kind of an idea in my head in 2008. Okay. And then Innovation Women. We did the crowdfunding for Innovation Women in 2014 and then launched the website in 2015. And this is all after, um, I would say, I started my career in the early 80s. And were there things that you learned from founding the first two companies that informed the launch of Innovation Women? Yeah, I think um, there were a couple of things that I did differently with Innovation Women. Uh, number one, almost immediately looked around for who the team would be because there's only so much of me and only so many hours in the day. I think all founders have a little bit of a sense of um, they can do it all and, and uh, eh, it's not really true. <laughs> um, you also need people with complementary skills. Uh, at first when I was starting Carlton PR Marketing and realizing that there weren't enough hours in the day I tended to gravitate more toward people who looked like me and thought like me. When I got further along in founding companies and working on projects like this, I looked more for people who were different from me. And do you feel like that's a um, – having people like utility players, I guess, is a – it's a thing. It's a term these days. Um, Ooh, sports terms. Exactly. Sorry. Um, <laughs> sports terms are good. Sports terms are good? Okay, fine. Um, Behind the blue line, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's curling. Oh, no. No, no, that was hockey. Oh, okay, great. See, so I play sports, but I don't. There's only hockey in our lives. There, okay. There's only hockey in our lives. <laughs> um, so um, do you feel like that's what's helped you grow? is having people who have complementary skill sets rather than the same skill set as you? Oh, absolutely. It's um, interesting. The business development person from Innovation Nights, someone who came to me about a year after I started Innovation Nights, um, we went on a sales call together. And I'd never gone on a sales call with anybody else. And after the sales call, you know, had to sit down and the, okay, here's your, here's the feedback from business development to the founder of the company. Shut up. <laughs> and it was like, uh, okay. Uh, but it was really shut up and listen. You know, ask them questions about their goals and you will learn far more than telling them all about what you have to offer. And it was great advice. I think I've been far more successful on sales calls 
when I listen to what people want and how we can help them achieve their goals. Um, do you find that, thank you for bringing up the topic of sales, do you, <laughs> do you find that you can leverage the services of each of your companies when you approach a new client? Like they're, they're each at a different point of entry, but can they be, are those things that founders really need to think about when they're on sales calls is here's what I, here's what I have to offer and the, that it can be broadened a little bit to and customized to fit the person that they're talking to. Yeah, I, um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about having three different companies is it's all related. It's all visibility because I continue to be breathing down everybody's necks with the tagline, visibility equals opportunity. And it really is so related across all three companies. You know, in some respects, we're offering visibility through speakers, uh, through speaking opportunities and media placements, and also social media visibility. So there's that common thread. But we can often show up at a conversation with, you know, call them a prospect and figure out what they need and figure out what path makes the most sense for them and their company. So I have a, um, a question related to geography and how the geography that you, and the geography that each of your three companies serves and, um, you know, how that's been different for you as a founder? So Innovation Nights, uh, and just so everybody knows, we're just outside of Boston. Uh, we spend a lot of time in Boston's innovation community working with startups and entrepreneurs. We like to call it an ecosystem, by the way, Ooh. the innovation ecosystem. So there, <laughs> Kirstie's stepping back out of the conversation and handing it back over to Bobby, the founder. Uh, Carlton PR Marketing, we have clients kind of all over the place. I mean, we've had clients overseas, we've had clients in Canada, uh, but the vast majority of, of our clients are startups and small companies in the Boston region. Um, Innovation Nights helps Massachusetts-based companies launch their new products, um, but we have started to see Innovation Nights opening up in other cities. Uh, we're not directly managing those ourselves. Those are being managed by someone on a local basis. But Innovation Women is really a global thing. Uh, I, when I started it originally, I thought we would just start in Boston, but the crowdfunding project just took off like a shot, really propelled by social media. And very quickly, we had supporters from across the country. And when we launched Innovation Women, we very quickly heard from ambassadors, um, people who were interested in being ambassadors in their local community. And so we have placements that we make all over the world as well. Um, just recently uh, we got an email from a woman who is speaking at a conference in London and she got that through Innovation Women. Um, I think, is that, that answer your question? It does. Um, so um, I'm pretending here that I'm part of the audience, um, <laughs> and um, if I were listening in to a female founder, what would be top of mind for me would be, um, so can you give me a little bit about your background? Like, do you have a family? <laughs> How do you manage all this? I.e., you're running three companies, when do you sleep? That's the usual question I get. Uh, so my background is I grew up in upstate New York. I went to college for broadcasting. Uh, back in the day, I was in radio. And I moved out to Boston after college, um, met a very nice guy, got married, had two kids, and my husband stays home with the children. So my kids are now 20 and uh, 15, 
And my husband has been home with the kids since day one. Uh, you know, it's interesting when we talk on panels that uh, I'm either moderating or am on as a female founder, you get a wide variety of personal situations and kind of how, how you manage to juggle things. And actually, I've been on panels where it's both men and women talking about it. And, you know, my husband and I laugh about it, and we tend to describe it as we're the perfect, perfect 50s couple. You have the stay-at-home, full-time, and the person who works. And my husband has some of the same challenges that women who stayed home with kids had. He looked at the job marketplace after, you know, it's like a dozen years of being home with the kids when the kids were actually at school part of the day and said, okay, how can I get back into the job market? And getting back into the job market when you've been out that long to him felt impossible. Um, the good news is I had a company and we put him to work working for us. So he now works for my company and obviously has a lot of flexibility to continue to serve as chief cook and bottle washer at home and also chauffeur with the kids. And, uh, and that keeps it possible for me to keep the three balls in the air of the three companies. Um, and I guess as a, as a follow-on to that, um, what I've noticed in um, working for you is that you, it really is a, a complete role reversal because you do spend literally every waking hour thinking about your three companies. <laughs> um, so um, if, you're a, if you're out there and you're looking to become a founder, um, just know that there are lots of different paths to get there um, and that Bobby created the right path for her. Um, doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody marries a musician. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it, what, what this balance for us did is, you know, my husband is a musician and now he has the flexibility to join different bands and be involved in different concerts and gigs. And most of that stuff is at night, but he's still at home during the days when, when the kids need him to get picked up wherever. All right, wonderful. Do we have any questions from the audience? Is there anything particular that you're, that you're looking to learn? I'm not seeing anything online. No, that means that we are asking the right questions. You're asking the questions that they wanted to ask. So that's that's always good to know. Excellent. Um, I believe that you can get in touch with us in oh so many ways, um, including tweeting at Bobby. Um, I wasn't watching tweet. Oops, sorry. Oh, we'll do that now. Well, she's doing that now. She's checking Twitter now. So she's <laughs> she's the fastest phone in the fastest phone in the east. I swear. Um, but uh, you, you're welcome to tweet at Bobby. Absolutely recommend going to any of our websites, um, innovationwomen.com, mass.innovationnights.com um, for more and, information. And, and carltonprmarketing.com. Yep. Um, and if you have questions after we log off, then um, we can uh, So we, we do have a question. And it says, how do you prepare, prepare yourself to, to the, the next, next question? question? Hmm. Not sure I understand that one. How do you prepare yourself to move on to the next company, maybe? Um, I'm going to answer that as a okay. question. And maybe maybe it'll get clarified from our, uh, our questioner. So I'm going to answer the question, how do you prepare yourself to move on to the next company or the next project? And in this case, some of it comes down to having people on the team who have the ability to run the project. Um, I'm going to use the example from Innovation Women, uh, I'm sorry, from Innovation Nights, 
uh, we have a program director who manages Innovation Nights, I would say 99.5%. Uh, I show up once a month. She hands me a script. Uh, I go and do the speaking per portion of it, and then we're on to the next event. Uh, she literally manages it every single, every single part of it. So I think the team aspect is super important to preparing yourself for the next project. In my case, all the companies are related. They do work together. There's definitely some back and forth flow of the resources that we have at any given time for any of the companies. So I'm hoping that that um, answered that. Yeah, I hope that answered the question as well. Answered that caller's question or, or <laughs> attendee's question. Sorry, <laughs> I feel like I'm on radio. Um, I did radio back in the day. <laughs> we both did. I know. <laughs> um, I think um, one other thing that I would probably want to know if I were sitting in the audience is how did you Was there any point at which you questioned the direction that you took for opening up a company? Like, how did you <laughs> choose which one to open? Um, well, obviously, when I started Carlton PR Marketing, and uh, Carlton PR Marketing was what I'd always done. I'd always done public relations. Uh, back in the 90s, you know, one day I was faxing in my driver's license to get a website. I had a little epiphany and said, oh my goodness, when this whole web thing takes off, the media are going to be in big trouble. And as a media relations person, my career is done. I'm toast. Now, obviously, the media hasn't gone away. It's just been added to. But online marketing, digital marketing, social media marketing have really changed the landscape. I mean, you have to remember. I started in PR during a time frame when, yeah, here it comes, the I'm old conversation. I started writing press releases on a typewriter. Those early press releases, you know, as far away from digital marketing as you can possibly get. But you also, um, I mean, to be fair, yes, you, you did start out there, but you were also an early adopter of Twitter. Yeah, um, you I love of, Twitter. Okay, so oh my God, I love people Twitter. To figure it out. I okay. loved it, and that was the impetus behind Innovation Nights. For me, it was all about a, a sandbox, a place to experiment, a place to figure out how to use social media for marketing. At the time I started with Twitter, people were not using it for marketing. They were using it as just a thing to talk with your friends. And everybody at that time frame was really figuring things out. They didn't know. So Innovation Nights was a place to experiment and figure things out. Innovation Women, totally different. That came about because I was mad. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I was annoyed. It is time to get things moving. Um, looks like we have a last question here. Um, we have one minute left. For women who want to move to the next challenge, such as not having um, experience in public speaking or seeking to move up in a company, what's the plan? how should we plan to do this if we're starting from zero? What did you do, Bobby, um, to help you move forward in your career? For me, it was all about finding other people who had accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. It was looking for somebody who had done what I wanted to do and figuring out what their path was. There are things like LinkedIn and such and interviews like this. I mean, it's figuring out who's doing things, how they're accomplishing those things, and where I can either adopt or not adopt from, uh, from what they've done. You know, it's learning from others. Uh, talking about... We've got, I think we've run over here. Do they stop us? Uh, 
Uh, we're still online, so we're, we're going to keep We're still online. Okay. Can you talk a bit about the format that you use for Innovation Nights? How does a night work? What makes it successful? So wait, I have to brag a little bit here. So um, <laughs> Innovation Nights has launched 10,000 products. No, it's a thousand. All right, it's launched a thousand products. <laughs> However, um, it has connected those launchers to more than two billion dollars in funding. It is a tremendously financially successful format. So now I'm going to let Bobby tell you what the format is. <laughs> yeah, a thousand companies, two billion in collective funding. Uh, what we've done is we've created a model that I call crowd promoting and it's a self-perpetuating marketing model. It's an event that happens once a month, but it's also a month-long marketing program that leads up to that live event. And that live event is all designed to get people in the room to blog, to tweet, to post videos and pictures. So in a single night, we've created this explosion of social media visibility and awareness for local startups. And then the next month we do it all over again. And all 10 companies that are launching are working together, they're collaborating, even if it, sometimes they feel a little bit like they're competing for attention, all of that interaction and the content created brings a community together to support local entrepreneurs and startups. And we talk a lot about that local community started. Oop, it's going to end in one city. It says, this presentation is overrunning by two minutes. We will automatically end in 1.50 seconds. Okay. So I think in that case, we're going to start to say our goodbyes. I'm super easy to find on Twitter because I still love Twitter. But if you want to reach out to us, you can do that through innovationwomen.com. There is a contact form there. You can also find me on Twitter uh, at Bobby C. Look, my little Twitter handle is right there. Or Women Inno. Just give us a yell. I'm always happy to talk to people and um, provide more information. I'm super easy to find online. And Kirsty, did you ever introduce yourself? I did. Oh, good. Um, All right. Just want to make sure. Um, so, at, <laughs> at which point I will also say you can also, because it's free, you can sign up to be an event manager on innovationwomen.com and look at all the wonderful speakers that we have, and you can even invite them to your um, to, to speak your, at your event to speak at your event. Or if you're looking to become a speaker, you can look at the profiles of other people and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's for me. I can do that too. So, um, and, of course, the best profile to look at is Bobby's because <laughs> it's, it's completely loaded up um, and looks like the perfect I followed profile. all the directions. Yes, right. I'm really good at that. All right. <laughs> so we're going to say goodbye, and thank you so much for joining us. And uh, – I think we're going to be having our own Innovation Women channel on Bright Talk. So I hope you'll come back, see some of our other speakers. Thanks, everybody. Bye.